Well, greetings once again, poetry lovers. Um, I thought I would start with a uh, with a split screen here um, and see if I can make this work uh, so that I could sort of say hello in person. Uh, so we're going to be taking a look at uh, at William Wordsworth's poem "I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud," and and all we're going to be looking at with respect to this particular poem today is going to be uh, figurative language. Um, and uh, so this is our, our unit of study for this uh, for this module. And I wanted to um, uh, to point something out to you, which is this: that that uh, metaphor is a um, uh, is a serious field of uh, of sort of academic study. Um, some small evidence of this is uh, an entire book. So this is sort of the um, uh, the Bible, uh, one of the first significant pieces um, that, to talk about metaphor, uh, Metaphors We Live By, by uh, Lakoff and Johnson. And then I've got another one here, uh, which is by uh, Zoltan uh, Kovetius, which is called Metaphor. So, like I said, here's a pretty thick book, right? That's, that's all it's dealing with are, are these elements of, um, uh, of figures of speech and how, um, how central a role they play in our lives. I may end up doing a presentation on this th to talk about um, the way that um, uh, that, that Covetius in particular takes a look at um, uh, at figurative language. Uh, you have been introduced to the to the concept from uh, I. A. Richards, which is that um, you've got the um, the tenor vehicle and ground as the three parts of a metaphoric uh, comparison. Uh, there is another way of looking at. I mean, there are other ways. But uh, the other main one is uh, what's called the target and source um, way of looking at conceptual metaphors. So I'm not going to dig into that today. Rather, we're going to use the uh, tenor vehicle and ground uh, framework that we've talked about already. And so I'm going to try to walk us through this poem by, uh, uh, by Wordsworth. And, uh, and let's look and see how he has used um, various figures of speech in service of the, uh, of the poem's central impulse. So I'm going to see if I can't uh, switch this back to uh, Visualizer and, uh, and keep going. So let's go ahead and, uh, and read the poem. Although, I do want to point out that, that today's uh, annotations are, are brought to you by a delightful pencil. Um, this is by one of the, the oldest pencil companies um, in the world. Uh, it's the Viarco. Uh, they are out of Portugal. And so this is the, uh, the Echo 260. Um, it is made from, um, uh, from cedar. Uh, sadly, it does not have a, an eraser. Uh, apparently, that is kind of the way of things in uh, in Europe. But uh, lucky for us, I've got uh, my happy little Pentel high polymer eraser in case we screw up in some kind of way. All right, so let's read the poem. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host, of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee, a poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Okay, so um, so here's a, uh, a poem in which you've got a um, uh, the poet is presenting a speaker who, right off the bat, is making a metaphorical comparison um, between himself and then the cloud, and we're going to talk about um, how um, how the, the these sort of figurative comparisons. Uh, shift and swirl about over the course of the poem. So if we're going to unpack this uh, this first you know kind of uh, comparison, then what we're going to do is is if we go with the um, uh, the tenor is going to be eh, let's see if I can uh, I'm not sure if that's going to work maybe that'll work better. Okay, so the tenor then I need to make a little darker mark. 
um, is going to be the speaker, right? And then the vehicle is going to be cloud. Okay, so uh, the ground then, of course, um, that's kind of funny. Uh, the ground associated with this cloud is is its is its solitary nature, um, and that it is uh, is something that we can uh, that it's it's blown by the uh, by the wind. So the cloud has no you know sort of agency in terms of where it's going. Okay, so what we're supposed to get out of this, so, so the point of the figurative comparison then, is that the uh, that the speaker. Uh, who seems to be in, in something of a muse. Um, he's thinking about things. Uh, maybe he's troubled by something, uh, whatever it is. But he is. But the, the, the verb wander suggests that he is semi-aimless, uh, meaning that he's not, uh, I mean, we, we assume he's not going to wander into the, uh, uh, into the lake uh, or the bay that he uh, uh, refers to, but, um, but that he's just sort of um, aimlessly going along. And so maybe this is, uh, I don't want to get too deep in this, uh, this this wandering could be something like a metaphor for his life, but we'll just go ahead and, and stay semi-concrete here and just talk about the fact that that here's this dude and, and he's out um, uh, in the country and, and and what does he see? Uh, he the little cloud, um, a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Okay, so uh, so. What he's done now, this this crowd and the host. So a host, of course, is a um, is a great multitude, and and we can see that what he's done is is you've got the implicit uh, personification, yes, uh, the personification then of the uh, of the flowers. So I'm just going to put a P here, and I'm going to say that that now uh, the tenor uh, is going to be you know for this particular metaphor, and I'm going to go ahead and slide it up here. So um, the daffodils, uh, the tenor then is the daffodils, and then the vehicle is going to be, um, you know, a crowd host of people. Now, worth noting here as well is you, you, you can't escape the, the sort of echo when we think about uh, a host. Um, it's, it's a word that we typically don't hear very much in contemporary speech. Rather, um, we, uh, if we take a look at, uh, at sort of Christian um, type theology and, and, and you look at things in the Bible, we think of a, the heavenly host. Okay, and so it, it should not escape your notice that, that he's planting an idea in our heads that he's going to follow up on, especially when he makes the later comparison between the, the, the multitude of daffodils that are, that are so golden and bright and shiny uh, there on earth that he compares with uh, the stars in the Milky Way. It's, a, it's a, a countless multitude in the same way that we would not be able to count uh, the numbers of angels in heaven. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the, in the breeze. So this, if you are, are doubting then that, um, uh, that we've got this, this sense of personification of the flowers, um, the word dancing um, is, is a pretty good indication because, um, you know, we might anthropomorphize, you know, certain uh, animals or birds that are, that are doing their mating, and I'm quoting here the mating dance, um, but generally it is, it is only human beings that, um, that have that, that sense of, of moving their bodies in uh, in time or in concert with music, okay? So again, further evidence of the personification. So this is, so this first stanza, uh, he's establishing this, this business about himself, his aimlessness, and then he sees um, this, this huge uh, number of, of daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees. So notice the, the, the visual element, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but see what he does with the the, the visual, okay, so you got a dude who's wandering on the, on the earth, right, terra firma, and then he takes you visually up into the sky to imagine the single cloud that's floating over vales or valleys and hills, okay, so a, a landscape springs dimensionally to mind, okay, and now from the, the, our gaze, which is, uh, our imaginary gaze, which has gone up from the cloud down to the See, valleys, which is lower, 
hills. He's raised it again. And now we're back down visually to the, the host of daffodils. Beside the lake, quick flash of, um, uh, of imaginary insight. And then beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Okay, so all that stuff, just if you can just uh, in your mind see all the movement that's happening with the imagery that's associated with the uh, with the metaphor. And I'm and I'm going to uh, to post on the canvas page, by the way, um, a uh, a correspondence between Charles Simic and Charles Wright, in which the two of them um, unpack the difference between um, uh, between metaphor and image. Fascinating. Um, and so what I'll probably do is, is maybe give you a little extra credit if you, uh, if you read that and then uh, answer a few questions uh, about it. Okay, so continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. All right, so now this, this is going to be a, a nice example of what? Hyperbole, right? Okay, so hyperbole because if you think about the, uh, the vast expanse of space, um, the Earth is is finite. Yep. So th there is a if he wanted to count uh, the number of daffodils, he could do it physically. He could do it. And I take him a while, but he could do it. Count the number of stars in the Milky Way. No chance. Okay. But he's trying to, to express a sense that this is how many he perceived there to be uh, there within the um, uh, the orbit of his vision. Okay. They stretched in never ending line. Okay. Again, hyperbole. So as we just suggested, that is a, um, a figurative comparison. Along the margin of a bay. All right, so the lake just went to a bay. We see this, that, that even though like Lake Michigan is, is pretty huge, when we think about a lake and a bay, I mean, a bay is, is much larger, and we also generally think of a, of a bay as something that is going to, um, to go into a larger uh, body of water. 10,000 saw I at a glance. Okay, once again. Okay, hyperbole. Sorry, not possible to, to see that many like at a glance. The, the, the brain just doesn't register in that kind of way. Um, and then toss their heads in sprightly dance. So I'm going to put another, uh, I mean, they're being personified this whole time, but he's, he's returning us to this sense that the, uh, that the daffodils are, um, are alive. They, they are, they're human-like, okay? All right, now. Um, so we know that the breeze is blowing, and so when breeze comes, goes across water, it generally is going to ripple the surface, and depending on how, uh, how steady the wind is, and, uh, and if it's, uh, you know, sort of going uh, in one direction and so forth, uh, and maybe blowing a little bit hard, then the, then the little ripples become waves and, and so forth. Okay, so depending on the size of the body of water, I don't know if you've ever been to um, a place like Lake Michigan, but, um, you know, you, you think of, of waves as happening, you know, the ocean because of tides. But um, a, a, as a child, went to Lake Michigan, you know, I was probably five years old or six years old, something like this with my, with my parents. Uh, and I mean, we're talking about like waves that are big enough to, you know, to like crash, I mean, to have, you know, peaks on them. So, so he's again, amplifying the, the, the situation here with his uh, descriptions of the scene. All right. So the waves beside them dance. So now we've got another personification, right? Okay, so the waves here then are, are being personified. Beside them dance, but they, they, the, the daffodils, outdid the sparkling waves in glee. Once again, glee being this, this sort of giddy state of, um, uh, of arousal, you know, just like super happy and, and so forth, right? So this is again that, that example of personification. A poet could not but be gay, okay, right? Like, and, and notice the, the, the contrast. He's, we've got a mood shift here. In the beginning, this dude is wandering, um, lonely as a cloud, okay, lonely. I mean, not solitary as a cloud, okay? Loneliness is a feeling. Solitariness is a state of being, all right? So we got a shift in mood that, that is, is not imperceptibly, but close to it imperceptibly happening to the, to, the, um, to the speaker that the poet has created, okay? So a poet, so we've got this self-referral going on, could not but be, it's, it's impossible not to be, okay? We could say this is hyperbole, right? In such a jocund company. All right, so let me point something out to you. So jocund here 
means like, um, again, like, like super happy and fired up. The, another name for daffodils is jonquil. So it, it, it should not, um, all right, so if, if you knew that, then it would not have escaped your notice that the word jocund and jonquil are so close to each other that he, he wants us to, be, wants that to be, you know, come to the fore of our mind, okay? Uh, even if it's just like sort of sidling its way up from way in the background, all right? And such a jock and company. What a great move by, um, uh, by William Wordsworth. Okay, so I gazed and gazed. So this, um, uh, this, this little parenthetical, uh, rhetorically speaking, that's called parenthetical, that insertion of gazed and gazed suggests the length of time that it take that that he he stood there and and looked at the scene, okay? Because if he just says it once, I gazed, but little thought. You, you rush too quickly past the, the 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 active verb that he wants you to uh, to pay attention to, okay? But little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. Okay, so so now what do we have here? Uh, let's take a look then at the so now the wealth. I mean, so like what are we talking about? So the tenor, the vehicle, okay? So the tenor is going to be the beauty of the flowers. Yes? And then the vehicle is valuable items. Something like that, okay? I mean, we, we typically think of wealth as being, you know, whatever's in your bank account. Well, you know, you might have artwork or you might have, uh, you know, uh, I mean, any, any kind of property, you know, your house, your uh, jet ski, um, you know, your, your uh, Land Rover, you know, whatever it is. Okay, so this is, would all be components of, of your wealth, all right? But what he's really talking about here then is that um, the, the, the feeling he's getting from this, from this situation, okay? I gazed and gazed, but little thought in the moment, right? In the moment, what is going to be the value then of this experience and seeing these flowers? I mean, look, I was out running this morning, 19 degrees. It's, it's you know, January 29th, maybe, okay? Uh, there, are, there were daffodils that were, um, that were beginning to bloom on one of my running routes, okay? Memphis, wacky. Okay, so I got to see some this morning. So here is, he's going to now tell you what the wealth is, like what this means to him. Okay, so the dismount stanza. For oft or often, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood. So this vacant, this vacantness here that we're talking about, th this, this should be, uh, should return you to, to what's happening there at the beginning about wandering. So this is obviously a, uh, a dude who thinks a lot, okay? And, and I, okay, if he's, if he's representative of the poet, William Wordsworth, then this is what poets do. They, they look around, and they see stuff, and they make connections, and then boom, here comes a poem. So in vacant or in pensive, so pensive meaning he's thinking about something specific, but also the mood. So, so again, this, this feeling is, is pervading him. And now... They flash upon that inward eye. Okay, so uh, we're talking about a couple of different ways to look at this. So the flash is the tenor is going to be the memory of the daffodil scene. What I'm going to call the daffodil scene, the thing that, that, that we were introduced to there at the beginning, right? And the vehicle is going to be a sudden appearance of light. So we all know what a flash looks like. So back in Wordsworth time, this would be like, you know, um, uh, the, the gunpowder, say, um, uh, going off as a result of a, uh, you know, a hammer striking and setting the powder off, or it might be a, um, uh, you know, some flint being struck, okay? Uh, it might be the um, uh, the ignition of a match, 
Um, okay, so today we would we would know that it's like you know you flip on the light switch or somebody's headlights come on or or whatever. Okay, but it's it's something where where light comes out of relative darkness. The inward eye then what we're really talking about here is his imagination. Okay, and the vehicle then is an eye, and he makes it specific to say inward. But this is a this is a nice example here of of of, um, of synecdoche because it's the it's the part for the whole. So it's not just this um, the 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 inward eye. It's it's all part of his his total sort of cognitive imagination. If that makes sense. Okay, and so it's then. They flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. So this is, okay, you could say that this, all right, is going to be an example of a paradox. And, and I'm calling it a paradox here because, uh, and I've said this before, that, that human beings crave society. We are social creatures. And so the idea that, that there would be bliss in in being alone runs counter to to our natures, but he's suggesting that that perhaps for his mind to work uh, poetically or otherwise, he needs to be by himself. But the company that um, uh, that that goes up to meet him then are all these daffodils. So you see how the the personification then comes full circle, because now then this this. Countless multitude, you know, that, that he compares to, um, you know, the, the stars that, uh, that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. And I guess, okay, so I should probably go back and, and, uh, and deal with this uh, one more time real quick. Like, so uh, all this, okay, so that's going to be, so the tenor then is going to be the uh, daffodils. And then the vehicle is... So you say daffodils um, in the scene. Okay, oops, sorry. Uh, stars in the Milky Way. Okay, all right. So now, here we are. So this is where that, that whole thing is going to come, is going to circle back. It's a marvelous poem because of the reflexive nature of it. They flash upon that anyway, which is the bliss of solitude. We already talked about the paradox of that. And then my heart with pleasure fills. Okay, once again, uh, we're talking about synecdoche. Okay, because it's not just his heart. We, we tend to center it there. It's wherever that, uh, that, that feeling of, uh, you know, like if you, if you are, um, you know, something terrible happens um, and, and you, you feel sick. So we, we tend to, uh, to localize that in the stomach, right? As opposed to when, when good things happen, uh, we tend to think of, that, of it as, um, as appearing in our hearts. But the heart then is just part for the whole, yes? Okay, and then my heart with pleasure fills. Now we've got to look at something else, okay? With pleasure fills. So we can look at this in, in a couple of different ways. One, here the tenor is the heart as part of the whole, and the vehicle then is going to be some sort of vessel, all right, something that can hold something. The other way to unpack that is this, okay, the tenor is pleasure, and the vehicle is some sort of liquid, okay, um, you know, like maybe yeah, I don't know, some wine or some water. Um, maybe uh, if you wanted to, let's say you're going to unpack this for, a, um, uh, for an essay, you might talk about, so if you had to choose uh, among an array of different liquids, um, okay, and not that you would necessarily do this, but, but perhaps you would suggest that it's, that it's water um, because human beings, you know, all animals need water to survive. And so perhaps what he's suggesting here is that he needs this sort of inspiration, uh, this flash of beauty in his life, uh, whether as a human being or as a poet or both, in order to survive, in order to live a fulfilled life. Okay? 
So then his heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So now he is personifying. So even in that, that sense of, of synecdoche, the part for the whole, now he is personifying his own heart, which suggests then the sort of interconnectedness that, that the body has with the, the inner part of the body. Um, uh, maybe even so far as to say the man's spiritual nature with the externalities of the world. Okay. So, um, fabulous poem, love this poem. And, it, and it's one that, uh, that it makes an appearance pretty much every, uh, every spring that, um, uh, of our lives. And, uh, and here in Memphis, of course it should, because as I said, the daffodils are already making an appearance. All right. So that's all we got for today. And, uh, hope you enjoy that.